Hello, my name is Nicole Grenan. I'm the public archaeologist for FPAN's Northwest region, and I'm here today to present this paper on behalf of myself and my co-author, Mike Toman, with the FPAN Coordinating Center. During the last year and a half, FPAN faced the very real challenge of attempting to meet the demands of the Heritage Monitoring Scouts Florida Special Category Grant, a project that was built upon the desire to work with members of the public with the reality of a pandemic. Not only were our abilities to interface and collaborate with members of the public, land managers, and other stakeholders mired by necessary health and safety protocols, but we were also somewhat limited in our ability to work together as staff. In the early months of 2021, FPAN Northwest and Coordinating Center staff received special permission from the University of West Florida to travel for research within the three county area around Pensacola. One of the benefits of the Heritage Monitoring Scouts project is that it allowed staff to maintain social distance while conducting monitoring missions outside. Staff were also largely able to drive separate vehicles to site locations. Although we weren't often able to work with members of the public during our HMS missions over the last 18 months, one way we attempted to make up for that was through strategic and persistent digital outreach and engagement. Although my co-author and I technically work for different offices of FPAN, we teamed up to produce visual products, that is photos and videos, during our site visits to be used as engaging social media content. This had largely worked for us on past projects, and with more users on social media during periods of quarantine and stay at home working, we figured that we might see additional benefit. Three popular social media platforms have worked for us at FPAN Northwest in particular, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Since we have such limited staff, me, and Mike is kind enough to help me out, it is important that we target social media platforms that have high local traffic and that are effective for our messaging. As a quick social media primer and as justification for our choices, here's a quick breakdown of the benefits of each of these platforms. Facebook is one of the oldest and most popular social media platforms in the United States, and worldwide it has over 2.5 billion active monthly users. To put that in perspective, that's about one third of the world's population. Facebook's groups, uh, Facebook's users in the US are primarily adults. They are increasingly from older demographics, but their users are dedicated with 75%, about 75% accessing Facebook at least once every day. One of the real benefits of Facebook is its flexibility and variety of content. We can post photos, videos, create event listings, do live events and create stories. Facebook also has a sophisticated algorithm for putting relevant content in front of interested audiences. The other side of that too is that Facebook's analytics are fairly detailed and give us an excellent breakdown of our audience. For example, we know that FPAN Northwest has followers that are primarily women between the ages of 35 and 44 at about 60%, with majority percentage of those followers living in Pensacola, Florida. Of course, Facebook has increasingly dominated, uh, become dominated by paid advertising and post boosting. Posts with money behind them do get a bigger reach, and for us, it can be challenging to break through that barrier. Instagram also has a very large group of users worldwide and draws from a younger demographic than Facebook. A recent poll found that 67% of 18 to 29 year olds in the United States had an Instagram account. Looking at FPAN Northwest followers, we see that they are primarily women, about 62% between the ages of 25 and 34, younger on average than our Facebook followers. Instagram places emphasis on visual content and is much more streamlined than Facebook. Although you can't do things like add links or set up events like you can in Facebook, if you're under a certain number of followers, Instagram is overall a very clean social media platform. And it is less easy for content to get lost amongst ads and other posts. Interestingly, Instagram's general engagement rates are about 70% higher than those for Facebook. That is people are far more likely to like or share your posts and its follower growth rate is about 9% on average. Finally, YouTube dominates our three social media platforms because it ranks even higher than Facebook in usage among adults in the United States. Young audiences are also on YouTube. The largest age demographic for YouTube is 18 to 29 year olds with 91% of those in the US using it at some point. Unlike Facebook and Instagram, YouTube's parent company is Google which means posting content on YouTube can help your search engine optimization rankings. For example, if someone searches Northwest Florida archeology, span our YouTube videos are more likely to come up than our other social media pages. Also, although this is true for Facebook and Instagram as well, video content is about 12 times more likely to be watched than a text post is to be read. 
FPAN Northwest has largely found this to be true with its posts across platforms. The downside to YouTube is that it can be very time consuming to constantly be creating new video content. Unlike Facebook and Instagram, YouTube does not really do the legwork of finding audiences for your content, which can be a good and a bad thing. What this means is that new people can easily stumble upon your content, but it is up to content providers like us to get their name out there and to stay on top of promotion. So let's talk about how we actually tied in our HMS missions with social media. Facebook has been our tried and true platform for engagement in Florida's Northwest region. With Facebook, we are really targeting our predominant engaged demographic in the area, middle-aged and older individuals. We also find that other partner organizations and agencies are active on Facebook, allowing us to easily collaborate and interact in that space. Facebook posts provide us the ability to talk about our work for the HMS project, discuss the area that we're working in, and then provide a disclaimer that the work we are doing has been permitted by the appropriate land manager. We can then add more detail and photo captions for the post. Through some trial and error, I figured out a pretty reliable formula for getting post engagement during HMS missions. I would add a landscape image, a photo of archaeologists working, featured plant, a featured animal, and a featured artifact if we stumbled across any uh, on, on the surface. My thought is that there is a little of something for everyone here, and these posts did indeed translate to more likes, more followers, and more shares. This particular post from uh, a trip to Gulf Islands National Seashore reached a substantial number of people, inching close to 10,000 people reached. For a non-video post, this number is really good for us. Also from posts like these, we've gotten requests for research collaboration and requests for features in local media outlets, primarily the local news. Instagram posts during HMS also spotlighted our work with similar photo and video content, just in a shorter format. One of the features we experimented with during our visits was Instagram stories, um, <clears throat> allowing us to draw out a narrative and add opportunities for Q and A's. These are good places for humor and for more serious conversations about archeological ethics and site preservation. One of the major things we got out of Instagram was the use of strategic hashtags to draw in new followers. While we used our usual hashtags, we also made sure to tag place names, local spots of interest and partner organizations. Finally, YouTube. While many FPAN offices have been using YouTube off and on for several years, Mike Toman and North Central Region's Tristan Herrenstein made a big push this last year to get an FPAN-wide YouTube channel off the ground. Their desire to ramp up FPAN efforts on YouTube was driven by the, the need to see more ethical archeological content that put preservation and protection at the forefront. Overwhelmingly, the majority of archaeological content they had noticed on YouTube included unethical looting or dubious pseudoscientific content. Indeed, if you type archaeology into the YouTube search box, you get very little content of quality. Since YouTube provides the opportunity for longer format storytelling through video, Mike dreamed up the Heritage Monitoring Scouts vlog series as a part of FPAN's Fieldwork Friday's YouTube playlist. The vlog series allowed us to talk more about our site visits, our methods, any impacts we noticed, and the importance of monitoring these sites over time. The videos also allow for additional voices. In many cases, we featured graduate student assistants and collaborating researchers. One of the biggest challenges with YouTube is, of course, making sure our content gets out there. And Mike and Tristan do an excellent job of mining the right hashtags and finding the right places to promote our videos. Although FPAN's YouTube channel is still getting off the ground, we've been able to consistently produce video content during the pandemic for HMS missions and other digital outreach programming. That is one of the ways we can increase our presence there and provide more of a platform for real archeological subjects. But instead of talking more about our social media efforts, we thought it would be most effective to show you an example of one of our HMS blogs from April of this year. I think it is important to keep in mind that none of our efforts required expensive or professional equipment. We've only ever used our phones and a handheld camera to produce our videos and photos. If you have any questions for us, we are happy to answer them. We're also open to ideas, suggestions, and of course, follows. Thank you. So hi again, my name is Nicole Grenan. We're out here on yet another Heritage Monitoring Scouts mission. And today we are back in Blackwater River State Forest attempting to relocate a 20th century mill site. 
And so we've come to an area in the park. This is a, a creek or a stream called Coon Camp Stream. Um, and then our, our river is just to the south of us. And the site was originally documented in 1992 and no one has really come out here since then uh, to relocate it and to see what's happened in those last 30 years. And so the actual mill site doesn't appear to be present on the landscape, but what we were able to identify was a dam structure that would have been used to uh, promote or inhibit the flow of water at the site. And we think that the mill that was here was a grist mill, so they were grinding grains into really small uh, particles that would you would later use for cooking. Um, and so we were successful in finding some of that dam structure. Of course, a lot of these mills relied on the flow of water from streams and the river in their daily operations. Yeah, a lot of the sites that we're visiting in Blackwater River State Forest are actually down kind of relic or maybe still active logging roads. So they tend to be a little bumpier because the trucks and the machines that are traveling down these roads are a lot bigger than the cars that we're using. So we've made sure to use our four wheel drive vehicles to get out here and especially after lots of rain like we've had in the last couple of days, uh, there are big puddles that we have to navigate through to get to or at least get close to the sites that we're trying to visit. So it definitely takes some um, off-roading skills or a sense of adventure to get out to these sites. So since we have been working in a state forest, a lot of these areas are actively maintained for logging purposes or for forestry purposes. And one of the things that we've had to contend with when planning where we're going to go to visit our sites is controlled burns. And so controlled burns are a way for the forest uh, to actively manage their site to prevent major fires from happening. It's actually a very healthy and natural process for the forests here um, to burn periodically. And so they do that during periods of time when the weather is amenable. So for us as archaeologists, coming into areas that have been recently burned is actually really beneficial because it gets a, rid of a lot of the ground cover like pine needles and leaves and things that have been kind of building up over the long winter and allows us to better see any artifacts that are on the ground. And so some of the artifacts that we pretty commonly find out here are what are known as hurdy cups. This is a little tiny piece of hurdy cup that we just came across on the trail. It's uh, isolated fine, but this was used in the turpentine industry, which was pretty big in Northwest Florida in the late 1800s, early 1900s. We'll put that back and record it. Here is more hurdy cup. I'm finding a lot of this around here. It's a nice piece, nice piece, nice hurdy cup, hurdy cup. So one of the questions we often get is how do we know how old a site is when we visit it? And the quick answer to that is we look at the artifacts and the material culture of the site. And so visiting this mill site and the leftover dam that we've got, what we see kind of sticking out at regular intervals on some of these vertical posts are piling our nails. And just by looking at the shape of the nail, we can tell roughly how old the site is. And the nails that are associated with this structure are what we call wire nails. And these are very uh, modern and recent nails. They have a, a circular kind of cutaway profile. And so that tells us that the site was probably constructed sometime in the 20th century. But just to add a couple more things, I think I have just a couple more minutes uh, for in terms of YouTube reach, uh, like Nicole mentioned, we've, we've been trying to really grow that page over the last year. We have, uh, I think at this point, 131 subscribers. Uh, but if you go look at, you know, the, the reach we have in terms of right now on our page through the analytics, we have over 13,000, almost 14,000 views. Uh, 791 hours of watch time, which I can't believe people have watched that many hours of footage that we put out there, and over 261,000 uh, impressions over a lifetime. So it's it's a good um, it's a good platform to try to create content. And like Nicole mentioned, we really want to add more content to that page um, because of the amount of looting that uh, is displayed on YouTube that has you know hundreds of millions of views at this point. Um, and then really like I wasn't trained in, in film filming at all. You know, it was all just from kind of, you know, learning and going on YouTube and watching how to videos. Um, but, you know, I started out filming stuff for FPAN over 10 years ago on this little tiny camera that was like cutting edge 
10 years ago and now it's you know kind of worthless but everything we shot on this was all done with the iphone i shot everything on my iphone i edited everything on my iphone and i even uploaded it to the youtube app through the through the iphone so the technology is there now where um the the video and the camera quality is you know just as good as a two thousand um, dollar dslr camera so i'll be i'll be around to answer any questions when we get to that session so thanks